I am delighted to have our next speaker because as you saw in some of the earlier slides, things like anxiety and fear of recurrence are really common threads in our patient community. We hear this all the time. And so we're really going to take a different tact. We have a wonderful speaker to really bring this topic out into the open and help you identify some resources and some things to just recognize that um, you can do in your own communities when you get home. But you know, managing the stress and anxiety of having a bladder cancer diagnosis is a lifetime job. And what happens with that diagnosis, it affects the individual who has the bladder cancer, but it also impacts everybody around. And so I'm really delighted we were able to get Dr. Pam Handelsman. Yep. And she is a health psychologist and assistant professor at Fox Chase Cancer Center here in Philadelphia. She earned her Psych D from Roosevelt University and completed a clinical psychology internship at the Washington DC VA Medical Center. So you've got a lot of experience with veterans. How many veterans are here? We've got a few. We definitely have a few. Um, you know, she followed up with a health psychology fellowship at the VA Maryland Healthcare System. And Dr. Handelsman really brings a lot of wonderful experience. And she is an expert in cancer. And so if she occasionally says breast cancer, she knows she's thinking about bladder cancer. So d just kind of work with her on that because she does a lot of talks. But anyway, she really focuses on providing evidence-based interventions to help cancer patients cope, focusing on pain management, fatigue, insomnia. I can go on and on, and you're probably all going to have that checklist of all of those things that are going on. She coordinates music wellness. I'd love to hear more about that at Fox Chase, because I think music does soothe your soul. Mm -hmm. So I am going to turn it over to Dr. Handelsman, and you've got your clicker, and we'll make sure it works. And we're going to have ample time for question and answer at the end. So let's go ahead and get started. All right. Thank you all for having me. Um, I really appreciate being invited uh, to speak. Uh, it's so rare that you get to be in uh, a patient advocacy-driven event, and this has just been such a thoughtfully put together um, presentation and, and also really thoughtful questions, so I'm excited to be here. Um, yeah, like Stephanie said, so please forgive me, I am talking about bladder cancer, but I just came from across town where I was giving a symposium on breast cancer, so um, I might have some word insertions, but bear with me. Uh, okay, so today uh, I'm going to talk about embracing wellness, uh, managing stress and anxiety after bladder cancer. Uh, my goal for this talk is to have you um, kind of be able to use a lens through which you can kind of see what's going on with you or with someone that you love. Um, I am a health psychologist and uh, what that means is that I'm a clinical psychologist, but I specialize in any time cognitive, behavioral, or emotional factors impact a health outcome, or providing interventions for somatic sensations, or problems like sleep and pain, um, as well as, of course, coping with cancer. So this is sort of like my bread and butter, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, we're going to, uh, in our time together, I'll give you some basic background information, um, common emotional reactions to bladder cancer, some strategies that are evidence-based for managing them, and then we'll get into some more practical, like nitty-gritty, something you can do by the end of the, the day today. Uh, and I'm gonna leave plenty of time for a Q&A. Uh, I think that I'm gonna try for 30 minutes. <laughs> So just to kind of get started, I want us all to sort of align with this concept of health. I follow the World Health Organization's definition of health, which is that health is a, complete, a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. The enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, political belief, economic, or social condition. So I abide by that, and in layman's terms, what does that mean? 
it means that we're going to work really hard to eradicate cancer, to uh, you know get rid of the cells that are in your body um, and maintain health. But if we are not taking care of the things that provide a good quality of life, including your emotional well-being, then we are not adequately ad addressing health. Mental health is health, uh, as defined by the world's experts in health. So I just want us to sort of align with that or consider that when we're thinking about our conceptualization of health, or how healthy am I? Talking about the psychological impact of bladder cancer, oops, I'm gonna go back. Um, I'm gonna show you some numbers um, that I want you to just sort of be aware of that sort of suggests that cancer and bladder cancer, it has an emotional impact on most people. And just because it is a normal or expected side effect of cancer or cancer treatments, doesn't mean that we have to just leave you there. So is nausea, and yet we give you Zofran, right? So just because it's expected doesn't mean that it's not treatable or worth looking at and treating. So check out the anxiety. Uh, uh, depending on the study, 20 to 70% of people with bladder cancer will have some form of anxiety. And the reason why the range is so big is because it depends on how they measure it. Is it that I worry more than I used to and more than I should? That might push you into the 70% range. Um, but uh, it could also be an anxiety disorder, something where your anxiety is uh, significant to the point where you're unable to stay in the present moment. It's interfering with your day-to-day -day life. Um, it's, uh, you know, you're starting to make accommodations or decisions based on your anxiety and not uh, what you may truly want deep down. So anxiety is really common. Check out depression, even higher, 78%. And a note about depression is that there are over a thousand different combinations of symptoms that will lead to a depression diagnosis. So a lot of times when we think of depression, we think of someone who's sad, who isn't showering, who hasn't left the house, and that is one presentation. But did you know that you can be depressed and not feel sad? that one of the symptoms of depression is either sadness or loss of enjoyment and motivation. So it's not that you're feeling sad, but that the things you usually enjoy just aren't giving you the same pleasure that they used to. And that could be depression. Especially in men, we find that it may not be sadness, it's often masked with irritability or anger. Um, which is a secondary emotion. So depression is something to keep your eye on. But all this to say that it's also worth bringing up to your doctor. It's not going to be weird to them. 78% of their patients are experiencing this. Um, and because there are so many different ways to be anxious and ways to be depressed, uh, if you think that there's something going on, it's worth getting screened. Ask for a screening. The idea of, um, I'm putting suicidal ideation on here, we do not have good numbers for the true prevalence of suicidal ideation in the population, in uh, people with uh, cancer, in people with uh, bladder cancer. We just don't have great numbers. Uh, it's not something people are all that open about, et cetera. There's some measurement issues, but all that to say that given that depression is up to 78%, we should also be aware that there may be some accompanying suicidal ideation, and that can run the range from, I wish I could go to sleep and not wake up. I don't necessarily want to die, but I, I don't know if I can handle this anymore, all the way up to thoughts of self-harm. And those are significant things to keep track of and follow along your trajectory. Uh, we know that just by uh, nature of having cancer, it puts you at higher risk for suicidal ideation. So, I know that it's a scary word. I know I talk about it all day, and so I'm comfortable saying it, but um, I also want everyone to be aware that this is something that uh, to keep an eye out for. Interestingly, for fear of recurrence, uh, it's 17% of people with bladder cancer after a radical cystectomy. We don't have good numbers for 
uh, beyond that yet. It's only been started to be measured in the last like five or 10 years. Um, but what's kind of interesting is two things. One is that there are differences. It's much higher in people who had an ileal conduit versus a neobladder. We also know that it tends to spike in year two or three after your surgery, not year one. So why is that? No one really has a good understanding of it yet. Like I said, newly, um, newly being researched, but in my practice, I have developed some clinical intuitions, some, some guesses. So this is not the literature speaking, and this is now just me, the clinician, speaking anecdotally. Um, I think it's a couple things. I think that one is that uh, the first year after surgery, you have a lot more check-ins, so you get a lot more reassurance and uh, time with your medical team, um, and you're just so focused on sort of navigating your new normal, your new body, and all that, that it's not going to um, uh, come up yet. The other that I hear from people is that, you know, we measure prognosis in five-year increments often, and so it's not that we, it's not to say that at five years, that's it, your time is up, but what we're saying is that we just don't have the data after five years. But despite that, a lot of people feel as they get closer to the five-year mark that they're edging closer to this cliff where they can't predict what's gonna happen next. We have less data. And so that can also, I think, I think that's part of why years two and three, things start to spike a little bit. And then finally, we can have some struggles with body image. So body image is a construct that's not just aesthetics. It's not just how do I feel about how I look? Do I feel attractive? Do I think other people are attracted to my body? But also, body image encom encompasses function. So what is my body able to do? Uh, lack of you know, changes in mobility and how I feel about those changes in mobility. There's also a, const a, a phenomenon that happens, and I think it's protective, where we'll sort of mentally or emotionally distance ourselves from the part of the body that's affected by cancer. And that's probably pretty adaptive at first. Um, but then, after a while, you start to hear people say, it just doesn't feel like me. This part of my body just doesn't feel like me. It's not fully integrated into how I see my body or how I think of my body. And we have this sort of uh, disconnect, this body disintegration. Um, it's not something that people often talk about, but it is something that I hear uh, throughout my day. So I just want to br bring that up. So these are all common sort of things that if you're experiencing them, they're expected, they're normal, and yet there are also treatments. In terms of quality of life, um, it's, this is another kind of interesting fun fact, is that quality of life ratings are not so different from the general population for people with superficial bladder cancer. Um, but uh, there are unique ways invasive bladder cancer uh, impacts a person's life. Um, and that's not to say that there is no impact, it's just that as with other things that happen as people age, there, um, you know, there's changes in quality of life. Uh, here's some main ones. Again, we don't have great numbers for bladder cancer specifically, but we know that 30 to 60% of cancer patients have a sleep disturbance or insomnia. And in retrospective studies, uh, when they ask patients to think back and list what was the first thing that they noticed changed about their health before they got diagnosed. Insomnia is often one of the first things that they started to experience. And it doesn't mean that insomnia causes in, uh, cancer. We don't have a good understanding of which direction it goes, its correlation. It could be some third thing that we don't know about. But it does sort of point to this concept of the hypermetabolic state of cancer may be starting to impact our sleep a little bit. On top of that, when you're not feeling well, you tend to nap a little bit more, it throws off and you have fatigue, it throws off your sleep cycle, and then, of course, the agents that we use to treat uh, cancer have fatigue and 
um, sleep disturbance and insomnia as a side effect. So it is a common problem. Uh, it does not go away uh, over time. Uh, once insomnia is um, present after about three or four months, it would require an intervention. First line treatment is cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, then we have chronic pain, of course, that comes up in uh, bladder cancer and in survivorship. Isolation, reluctance to leave the house. A lot of times people are afraid of leaking or smells. Um, and then they stop uh, doing things that are important to them or spending time with the people that matter. It also can impact your relationship, not just with sexual dysfunction or sexual issues or changes, but also when you're going from partner to caregiver and then back again and navigating those dual roles, it does impact the dynamic a lot. And um, then how do we approach both of those things? You know, we'll talk a little bit more about caregivers uh, a few slides in, but there are some ways in which uh, this can impact your relationships. Some people it brings them closer, some people it, it highlights the rifts. But before we can talk about what to do about it, we have to understand what maintains distress. So um, you all have uh, in front of you some object. If you can choose an object that's small, that can fit in your hand, a paper clip, a piece of paper, a napkin, your pen, hair tie, air, I don't care what it is, hold it in your hand, please. Okay. Yeah, ring, I saw a ring, that's a good one. Yep, and now I want you to do what my mom told me to do when I would go to her and I'd say, as a kid, and I said, Mom, I have a bruise right here and it hurts when I do this, and what did she tell me? Don't do that. Yeah, thank you guys, stop touching it, right? And so that's how we're oriented. We're oriented away from pain. So what do we do when we have pain, emotional or physical? Well, let's do what we, our mom told, what Mama Handelsman told us to do. Hold it out. Get it as far away from you as possible. Really get it out there. I'm serious. I know it feels silly, just do it. Go with me here. And really, you know, you don't want this. And for a while, this feels okay, right? For a second, it gives you a little relief. It gives you space. It gives you a break. But what's going to happen the longer you hold this out? Yeah, your arm gets tired. I already see some people kind of go, yep, get it right back up there. You don't want to feel that anxiety. You don't want to feel that depression. Get it up there. And so the longer you hold it up there, then what's going to start happening, not only does it get heavy, but then there's like secondary pain in your arm, right? And then after a while, you get so tired that it's going to take more resources <sighs> to keep it up there. And then what's gonna happen, right? It's gonna start hurting and feel really heavy and it's gonna start getting distracting. Perhaps you're having a hard time paying attention to me right now, <laughs> all right? So let's do what maybe a psychologist would tell you to do and that is let's put it on our chest or in our lap. It's still there, right? It's still there. I feel the weight of this pen in my hand right now. And in fact, I actually have to have a little bit more courage to pull it closer to me. But it's not that secondary stuff. It's not the, the pain in my arm, the distraction. I can walk around all day like this holding this pen. I could. And so this is how we have to manage our emotions. Um, we know that the more you push them away, they don't go away. They just get heavier. Um, and so. That's sort of what maintains the distress, uh, is if we never deal with them, they just get bigger and bigger. And then when we finally feel them, we feel totally overwhelmed because it's this huge amount of emotion tumbling down on us. We also know that the way that we respond by losing connection to activities that give your life meaning or give it a fun event, you know, it makes it harder for you to uh, connect to why. Like, why do I go through all this? 
if I'm not going to spend time with my friends, if I'm not gonna go out of my house. Um, and so that tends to maintain the distress too. The other thing I wanna highlight is, I like this um, cartoon. Uh, it's from The New Yorker. I don't know if you're familiar with their, they have a, a column where they have like, um, like caption contests. And about two years ago, they had one that was, um, what is it called? Coping strategies for when your pet seems under the weather. And so people put it, like, wrote in with coping strategies. And I liked this one. Call into work and take the day off so that you can hyper-focus on your worst fears without distraction. <laughs> right? So that's what happens when we isolate, when we are at home. And the, the, other, the third one is passive coping strategies. Now, passive coping strategies are all the things that you're doing to try and avoid your emotions, to numb. Um, that can be substances like marijuana or alcohol or other things. That can be um, locking yourself in your bedroom and taking a nap. That can be zoning out in front of the TV. That's all of this stuff. And this helps for a little while. It gives you a little space, and that's fine. There, I'm not going to demonize any one coping skill. However, it's over-reliance on passive coping strategies that prevent you from actually navigating and managing your emotions that tends to maintain the distress. So now that we understand about how avoidance is uh, hard to break because it's reinforcing, but it also reinforces our distress, let's talk about what we can do to manage it. The first is support systems. I want you to find a community. Do you know, um, a metaphor I often use in therapy is, uh, is anyone familiar with the oak tree versus palm tree metaphor? Why, in, why palm trees survive hurricanes? One person? Because they bend, that's right. They have a flexible trunk. And so whereas an oak tree tries to be sturdy and push back against the wind, a palm tree bends and goes with it and trusts that the wind will not break the, the palm tree. It's designed for this. The second reason that it survives a hurricane is that its root system is different. An oak tree has a few really long um, roots versus a palm tree has a lot of short roots. Uh, it's really dense and it acts like an anchor, it holds it down. So what is the point I'm trying to make about emotions? Well, when you're in an emotional hurricane, I want you to try not to push back so hard against it, but rather go with it, welcome it, manage it. We know that these feelings come from you, so they are not bigger than you and know that you will not be broken by any one emotion, and then rely on your anchors, your support systems, and it might need to be a diverse group of people. Um, I also work really hard on effective communication strategies. How many of you, when you were diagnosed, were told by a well-meaning person, oh, I'm so sorry, um, you know, I'm here for you, anything you need, just let me know what I can help you with. Yeah, and how many of you could actually answer that question in that moment? No. It's just one more thing you have to do is tell them how to help you. It's like, come on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so here's the thing. You probably were pretty independent and didn't need a lot of help before uh, or needed less help than you need now. And so we have to get comfortable at how to ask for help. I want you to make a list of specific things that you need help with that you can just give to them. Take it off your plate, oh, let them own it completely, give them some, a job. Sometimes people need a job, especially when they're like focusing in on like what, how much you're eating or how much you're drinking. Like just give them a job, something else to do. All right? Um, I want you to differentiate. There's two types of social support. There's emotional social support, which, uh, you know, call them if you're having a bad day or, you know, you need to be talked down. Um, but also there's instrumental support, which is running errands for you, um, dropping you off somewhere, uh, that kind of thing. And most people are not good at both. Most people are better at one than the other, right? So if we keep going to 
your sister-in-law who's really diligent about dropping off a meal every Tuesday. It's your treatment day. It's a long day at the center and you're home and you can't um, you know, even fathom making a meal and that's her job is meal prep. She may or may not be the same person who's really good at talking you out of you know, fatalistic thinking. And so I want you to go where people's strengths are. And similarly, people that are really good with emotional support may not have the resources for the instrumental support, financially, time, distance, et cetera. Um, so make a like, diverse list, use your diverse group, give everyone a different job. Um, and make sure that caregivers find their own support systems. We know from research that the average cancer caregiver uh, spends 30 minutes on, or 30 hours, sorry, on caregiving a week on top of whatever job they're doing and whatever other caregiving needs. We also know that caregivers often have uh, the same or even higher levels of distress than cancer patients themselves. And we don't know exactly why, but my hunch is that it's about helplessness and, and control and you know um, feeling out of control and the helplessness of watching someone you care about struggle. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't talk to your caregivers and rely on them for support, but it does mean that we need to make sure that caregivers are getting their own needs met as well. We can seek out professional support, medications, for example. Um, I put here, I don't want to speak out of scope, so I'm going to only touch on this a little bit, but we want to prioritize long acting over short acting. Short acting anxiety meds, they're great for like a one-off thing, right? You're um, in the hospital after a procedure and we just need to make sure that you're sleeping enough that you can actually recover and so we're going to use it for that short period of time. You have a scan every three months, it's scanxiety is a real thing, you know, or you have tests coming up every three months and it's okay to, to take you know, a short acting something in, in one-off terms. But what we are now learning is that long-term use of some of these medications have their own issues and put you at higher risk for things like dementia. Um, they are habit forming, some of them. Um, so we wanna make sure that if you're relying on some of these medications every single day, uh, these short acting meds every single day, it's clearly not providing the coverage for your symptoms that you need and uh, talk, you know, be open to the concept of a longer acting uh, agent. Um, then where I come in is empirically supported psychotherapies. Uh, there are many treatments for, anxi for anxiety and depression. These are the three that are empirically supported for patients with cancer. Cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, and meaning-centered psychotherapy. Meaning-centered psychotherapy is the only empirically supported treatment for existential distress. The why me's, the what's it all for's, and the who am I now's. That's existential distress, and it was actually designed specifically for cancer patients. And so the work they're doing versus CBT and ACT, which they are working to extend this to cancer patients, uh, Meaning-centered psychotherapy, the work is being done to extend it to other uh, populations. And then we have integrative and complementary, integrative health and complementary therapies. The keys here being the words integrative, integrative, meaning that we're integrating it into an existing care plan, and complementary, it complements your care plan. It's not the only care plan uh, for your mental health. It can go a long way for preventing uh, issues, but if you do have depression or anxiety, this can be a part of your care plan, but it is unlikely to completely treat it. And these are all evidence-based, so I'll let you kind of read these. MBSR, mindfulness, music, art, massage, mindful movement, acupuncture, acupressure. Um, as obviously I'm biased towards music wellness and art therapies, but uh, I do believe that those are some of the things that keep us human, you know? Uh, when we have bits put in and bits removed, these are some ways that we can preserve our humanity. Um, and then self-care strategies, meditation, relaxation strategies. I want us to consider minimizing our internet searches. 
Um, so the unless way... Unless it's beacon.org. Yeah, unless okay. it's beacon.org <laughs> or ACS or NCI yeah. or mm -hmm. some validated. But um, the way that the internet works is that there's an algorithm. And I'm sure that there's someone here who actually knows more about this than I do. But what we do know is that the more you search for something, the more it, the algorithm thinks you're interested in it and then presents you with more of it. And then it becomes increasingly more typically uh, emotional. Um, and so then what we want to do is uh, you enter into this negative feedback loop. So try and minimize that. And at some point, it's, it has diminishing returns. You've learned everything there is to know about the thing. And there's not much left for you to learn. Uh, and then pleasant activity scheduling, mind-body activities. Again, active coping skills, using your relaxation strategies, telling your friend that you're my joke of the day guy, and that's you're my moral support guy. You know, whatever it is, that's going to be an active coping skill instead of passive. Uh, that's going to hit harder. That's more impactful. And just when you thought that I was done talking, I'm not. <laughs> I'm sorry. But where are we on time? How far have I been going? We have, we're good. OK. All right, so practical resources and tools. Uh, how to find professional support. So you can find that by asking for your cancer center's psycho-oncology department or social worker. You can go on psychologytoday.com. Almost anyone who's in private practice has a profile there, and you can search based on location, gender, presenting problem, um, insurance provider. Did I say that already? There's a lot that you can sort by. And then you can also get a list of in-network providers from your insurance company. A lot of times specialists that are therapists in private practice do not take insurance. So it's also worth asking your insurance provider about your out-of-network benefits. Because what will happen is that you'll, get, uh, you'll pay your therapist and then they'll give you a super bill and then you'll submit that to your insurance for repayment for yourself. I think that it's a flawed system, personally. I'm glad that I can take insurance, et cetera, but it is an option that you might want to look into. Support groups. Check out BCAN. You guys have, I was on the website earlier today just checking it out, and there's a great listing uh, and connecting to support groups. You can also call cancer care, uh, cancer center support groups, American Cancer Society listings, and be open to, um, uh, Zoom, you know, to telehealth. The research shows that the outcomes are equivalent to in-person support groups. And um, if you don't like the ones that are local, you can, with the internet, you can go even further afield. Uh, there's someone who joins one of our support groups at Fox Chase from North Carolina every month um, because they just prefer the, they found a good group of people, they felt connected, that's where they are. Um, I want to have a, can I make a little disclaimer about like Facebook groups? Okay, so Facebook groups can be really great because you can get a lot of good information. However, I want you to also remember that people that are doing well and like outliving their life are probably not posting on your Facebook group. And so what is left is this kind of biased view of kind of worst case scenarios and people that are really, really distressed or really struggling on Facebook groups. They're not moderated. And so whereas a Facebook group is certainly easiest, it's also, again, thinking passive versus active, right? Um, a support group that's led or coordinated by a trained facilitator is going to go a long way towards making sure that everyone feels emotionally well and safe uh, and able to share and not just sort of getting information and then like not sure what to do with it and not able to sleep and it, maybe you're even looking at it in bed which is going to impact your insomnia but that's a different talk <laughs> so <laughs> negative chain of events right getting it's, the picture yeah <laughs> right so exactly it's all about the feedback loop some self-guided resources that I like. These are three self-help books that I just find to be broadly helpful. Um, the Happiness Trap actually is not cancer related at all, but it's a really nice book for um, how learning how to manage and cope with emotions. Um, it is the kind of book that you have to do. You can't just read it, but it really does help. 
um, and that's an ACT book, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. The second one is um, designed to be like a encyclopedia of coping skills that are evidence-based. And so there's like a chapter on anxiety, there's a chapter on depression, and so you go to the chapter that you're experiencing, and then you can read through and see if get any good ideas from that. So it's not meant to be read, it's meant to be like a reference resource. And then Stand By Me is a new one, um, a guide to navigating modern meaningful uh, caregiving. So this is uh, how to find meaning and how to uh, reclaim kind of your identity as a person, even in with your role as caregiver. And then we have two mobile apps. Um, these are free, HIPAA compliant, so they won't mine your phone for data, um, like other mental health apps. The first is called COVID Coach. It has nothing to do with COVID, except that it came out during COVID when everyone was having issues and stressed. And so it's chock full of coping skills that are evidence-based. You can sort of sort through them. It's like, I had a patient tell me it was like Tinder for coping skills. Um, find so, the right match. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, find the right match. I didn't like it, swipe left. I didn't like it, swipe left. I found this one, hit the heart button, and now you've got a list of coping skills that work for you. And then Breathe to Relax is also HIPAA compliant free. It's designed to teach you different relaxation strategies through breathing. Um, this one's really old. I'm sorry. It's it's like so old that it's like green writing on blue background old, um, but it works. It's not glitchy. It just hasn't been updated. It's a great app. If you can get over the, the aesthetics of it, then it's worth downloading. <coughs> and then this is the biggest one, creating what I like to call a cope ahead plan or setting yourself up for success. Um, we know that emotions hit your brain milliseconds faster uh, they hit, than your uh, critical thinking part of your brain can come online. So what does that mean? That means that when you're anxious, it's hard to come up with a plan. It's hard to problem solve. So I want you to come up with early warning signs that you're getting stressed and write those <coughs> down. So basically the question is, when do I need to use this list? And think about it broadly. Thoughts, behaviors, emotions, physical sensations. What can I do myself to help me feel better uh, that I don't need to rely on other people for? And then who can I call? And this could be to take your mind off of it so they don't even need to know you're stressed. It's just you know that they're good at yapping and so you can get on the phone and let them tell you about whatever they did that week and that'll keep you occupied. Or uh, you can have someone that you can call to tell them that you're struggling and they can help you walk you through it. So that's sort of psycho-oncology in a nutshell uh, from a bird's eye view. I went through it really fast, I'm sorry, but I wanna leave enough time for questions. That was great. Um, last slide. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Pam. That really was very helpful because I think you gave some really great resources and we will make all of this available to you if that's okay. Mm -hmm. We will send all of this information out. <clears throat> Thank you. So we'll open it up to questions, but I really liked a lot of what you had talked about in terms of the emotional hurricane. You know, so often we're told, just fight, just fight. You can fight this thing. And um, Sometimes you have to bend a little bit, and sometimes you have to be flexible and you know adapt to whatever the new changes are. So sometimes mm -hmm. just taking that fighting stance is not going to serve you well. So yeah. what did you have for suggestions for people's mindset to retrain themselves? So we're all oriented away from pain, and our particular culture really values like the power of positive thinking. And it is true that you know your mindset can make a difference, but if how you're really feeling is scared and sad, and then you're just pretending to be like happy, you're not actually not scared and sad. You're just now hiding it and stuffing it down. Doing this, right? So <clears throat> what I really encourage you to do is tune into yourself. Um, everyone feels things a little bit different, but when you're scared, where do you feel that in your body? When you feel sad, where do you feel that in your body? 
And even tiny little things, there's a strategy called name it to tame it, where literally, if you just name all the emotions you're feeling in that moment, it takes the intensity down. Um, because overwhelmed is not an emotion. Overwhelmed is a state when you have a lot of strong emotions all happening at the same time. So if you can name what's in that like hurricane or what's in that soup, mm -hmm. it takes the intensity down. So it's even simple things like just labeling. And I think that, you know, from everything I've talked to so many people over the last 10 years, that I think it also applies to caregivers. You know, so often the family members, especially, that are supporting their loved one who happens to have bladder cancer, feel like they have to absorb everything. And they often put their own health at risk because they forget or don't have time to do their own routine things. But they also absorb that stress. And first thing I hear is, as a patient, I don't want to tell my loved one mm -hmm. that I'm afraid. Because if I do, they're going to you know, stress out about that. And as a caregiver, I don't want to tell my person who's the patient, I'm terrified. Or I'm overwhelmed by all of these things. And so there's this opportunity for miscommunication. But name it to tame it. I really like that. That could stick. That could be a thing. Um, yeah. Because if you're feeling all of these things, sometimes it's really hard to bring it up. But when it's something that's impacting you and impacting your relationship and how you're working together as a team, remember I said earlier, joys shared or doubled, burden shared or halved. I think that that's something that if we can just get to a place where we can share where we are without expectation, but just say, I'm just letting you know, I'm having a moment, mm -hmm. um, name it, tame it, work together, I think makes a huge difference. So we can open it up for questions. Can we grab a mic for Brian here in front? Come on back. And then Nick, be ready on your side because there's going to be one there too soon. Soon, I'm sure. Hi, uh, Brian Billings. And about six months after my radical cystectomy and neobladder creation, I was very honored to work with Beacon and through a coffee and conversation start the New York City Bladder Cancer Support Group. And over the three years that I've had it, one of my mottos has really become, I experience my best self in communication with others. And I'd like to suggest that everyone go to a support group. Um, I think you can not only manage your own stress and anxiety, but just as important, you can help others manage theirs. And that there's such a rewarding give back for that. And I know in my group, we welcome not just patients, but caregivers. And I think that's probably pretty universal. So, um, and Beacon has a state-by-state -state easy reference in your resources mm -hmm. page. So thank you so much for all you do for us with that. You're welcome. Any questions on the other side? It's hard to see because there's a lot of glare. So can I just, oh, there's one. Okay, a question. Okay. And also you can ask questions on behalf of a friend. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. asking for a friend is totally fine yeah. here. All good. I thank you, that was a very excellent presentation. Mm -hmm. um, in m my own experience, trying to seek out a therapist just to talk about cancer, um, trying to find a list of people in the community who say that they know something about cancer, mm -hmm. to talk to a cancer patient, I found to be very difficult. The first person that I did see really didn't get it and was actually almost offensive, saying, just don't be so negative. And so <laughs> I left that person. But um, I actually did then, through my, you know, the plan, the health plan, find somebody who is a cancer survivor. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's developing a good relationship. But can you talk about finding the, you know, a psycho-oncologically informed therapist, I think, is more difficult than I ever imagined. Mm -hmm. It really is, um, I think, because there are so many people who, even though there are so many people whose lives have been touched by cancer, people that they know, um, maybe never received the feedback that that was unhelpful. And so then that person nodded their head and so they said, I'll use that with my patients, right? And then they go on. Um, you know, it really is, 
it is challenging. Um, I think that you start with um, narrowing it down to uh, who says they have exposure to cancer and then reading, really reading the fine print of their, um, you know, their website. And if they're mentioning things like fear of recurrence or nuances, then you can have a better sense of like that they might know what they're talking about. But also, you know, support groups, um, if someone's hooked in with, I've gotten a lot of my patients from word of mouth from other patients, and I think that's sort of how therapy tends to go. Um, you know, asking your doctor, your oncologist, if they, you know, your cancer center, do they have a list of referrals? Um, I would say ask other people that are in the community and you're more likely to get navigated towards. Uh, a, a cancer-informed uh, psycho-oncologist. Um, unfortunately, like I said, a lot of uh, specialists don't take insurance. Um, and so if you do have out-of-network benefits, it opens things up for you. But um, if you're in the Philadelphia, New Jersey region, just reach out to me and I have a list. So, um, And if you're Fox Chase, you can come to me. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great. Great to, great to know because, again, yeah. Oftentimes we just, we don't own it. We just mask it, yeah. you cover it, paint it with anger paint, and then you just know that you're really having a hard day, but you're, you're expressing it, but it's not getting at the root problem, I think is really mm -hmm. the issue that owning it is really a hard thing for many people to do, especially when you've always seen yourself as a strong person, or you know, you've always held the role of being the one that was doing everything for the family, and now all of a sudden you're gonna expect people to do things for you. It's really hard. You know, I know that some of you are experiencing the same kind of situation where it's like, I've always been the strong one. I've always been the one to help, and now I need help. Mm -hmm. And that's really hard. I liked what you talked about earlier with integrative and complementary medicines and things along those lines that don't replace what you get from your doctors, mm -hmm. but, they're meant to kind of accentuate. And so how do people sort of navigate those things? Like obviously music is the good one for you. You <laughs> like the music therapy, but some people are a little more artistically mm -hmm. inclined. So how do you kind of find your right alternative complementary, integrated therapy? I think similar to finding the right therapist, you know, you have to, you have to try a few. You know, just sort of experiment and see if this is something that could feel right for you, that feels good for you, um, or maybe it feels right, but you just don't like that person's style. And then you're kind of, all of that is data. All of that is information. Um, you know, I think also drawing on things that you used to enjoy. If you have an extensive record collection, then you probably would like music therapy. If you have, um, you know, if you're if you used to enjoy uh, going to the art galleries, um, then maybe art therapy is for you. But here's something weird: is that I cannot carry a tune. I clap off beat, and I uh, honestly, when I go to concerts, I'm five two and three quarters, and I usually can't see, and so it's like not that enjoyable all the time, unless I'm sort of standing towards the back. But my friend is six foot three. Anyway, it's a whole thing, but. Then, at the same time, I got put in charge of music wellness, and now I love it. So I want you to also uh, be willing to stretch, be willing to do things outside of your comfort zone. I would have thought I was an art therapy gal, but I'm not. Turns out. Well, I, know I like to bang a drum. There's a lot of research because it's making its way to the popular mm -hmm. media through the news about the benefits of music and all the, you know, the deep emotions that can be released through things that you hear, things in your past. This, you know, music is the soundtrack of your life. When certain songs get played, all of a sudden you can see yourself back in your teenage years or when you got married or when you had your first kids, all of those things mm -hmm. and the things that gave you joy can be really beneficial, whether it's music or art therapy or any one of a number of things. But I think the biggest takeaway is don't keep it inside. Mm -hmm. Don't hold it for yourself for very long because it's hard. And you need to be able to bring it in and address it. That's right. That's exactly it. Yeah. Oh, someone Other over there. Other questions? Yeah. 
Hi, I wanted to say it was a fabulous presentation. I also think it's really important, not only for cancer survivors, but the general population, I think what you were talking about. But I also wanted to say that in New York, with the um, Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and we have an integrative medicine component, and it's open to everyone. Now that it's on Zoom, there's music therapy, there's meditation, there's Tai Chi, everything is available. Anyone who wants to access those programs could just go online to mskcc.org and actually take part in those programs. Uh, and I also wanted to say they have social workers when I first was diagnosed was nine years ago and we had in-house in support groups and we had social workers uh, was, as part of the as part of the treatment and um, they were life-saving yeah. really so it's a kind of therapy is that for me oh <laughs> anyway thank you yeah what is the website again what did you speak <laughs> mskcc Dot org Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And anyone can just go online. There's music therapy. Mm -hmm. oh, I must say there was art therapy before the pandemic. We yeah. don't have that. But all these different things. You can have Tai Chi, yoga, uh, meditation. And check your senior centers. Like you might need to, it may not be cancer specific, but you know, check for local resources. And then locally, there's the Cancer Support Network. There's um, the Kin Center in Bucks County that offers, you know, Kin Center is free, actually, for anyone in Bucks County. Um, but yeah, uh, do your searches, and, and you'll be shocked at what you can find. Yeah. Hi, th thank you for this. A lot of the ideas I've tried, and a lot of them really work. Uh, one thing I'd like to say that works the best for me is to be in an environment like this, mm -hmm. where you know the wounded heal the wounded. You know, it's 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 a safe environment where you know people who have been through it and get it can you can have this level of honesty and and co problem solving and sharing. So sometimes for me it's not been out there looking for the answer, but it's been the ability to connect and relate and not feel so alone. And it's been through groups like this, it's been through the the ANOVA program that Karen runs where we on, are on you know, a call once a month. And we don't necessarily drive to solutions, but a, lo a lot of it is about sharing. And, um, and then also with my mentor, he doesn't have every solution through the BCAN uh, mentorship, survivorship program. He doesn't nearly have all the answers, but he's a step ahead of me, and he can really relate to what I've gone through. So that goes a long way in terms of like that uh, alleviating the stress and letting it out, and and um, being able to to breathe and feel that you're you're connected with people who are who are like-minded, and many of them have had a lot of success. Yeah. I mean, look at the bathroom app, right? Like, mm -hmm. another yeah. one is called Flush. <laughs> but like, you know, these are things that you guys can have shorthand conversations about amongst each other. Uh, I don't know who was next. Was someone over here? Uh, there's one in the back. In the back. Who has and a microphone, then. and we'll move them this way. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know what you think about like healing touch. Mm -hmm. And also now I've heard a lot about grounding and not just grounding, taking your shoes off and putting, you know, walking in grass. But now there's grounding blankets. Weighted, I'm, I, like weighted blankets and stuff. No, no, they're they're like a they've they've got like a charge to them or something. They're not just weighted. But I mean, what's your thoughts also on on both of those healing touch or this yeah. new grounding? Um, so the research is not there, but. The way that I um, sort of approach it is if you can afford it and it's not making, it's not hurting you and it hurt and it helps, sure, do it. Um, but there's no real research on the energy healing um, properties and things like that. Um, Reiki, for example, uh, does show reductions in anxiety um, from the beginning, you know pre to post, uh, like after a Reiki session, people feel more relaxed and less anxious. However, when they compared it to sham Reiki, where someone was just standing next to you but not doing Reiki, they didn't outperform each other. 
Um, <laughs> right. So it was just like the feeling of being in a caring environment with someone else around uh, was what did it. So is it Reiki? Can you afford it? Then do it. You know, it helps you, but it's not necessarily going to outperform someone standing next to you doing nothing either. You know. Okay. Yeah. The mic is coming this way, but we'll stop here first. Okay. Um, I uh, I went in for TURBT three and a half years ago, and it was non what non invasive cancer, uh, and I have had trouble telling people about it. I will tell my family, my family certainly knows. If I have the least problem on anything else, I, you know, we, we joke, a hangnail can really mm -hmm. be an issue with me. But I won't tell people. I am afraid to tell them that I have the cancer. Yeah. You know, so how do you get around that? Do you just out and tell everybody or, <laughs> you know, do you hide it? You know, I think that uh, it's not all or nothing. And um, from a therapist perspective, when I say like, is something good or bad, it's always actually like, does it move you closer or further away from what's important to you in life? If it's something that moves you closer and to what's important to you, so say like, I don't know you, but say family is super important. But if you don't tell people, then you're not able to, go to whatever trip because they haven't planned it around your needs, um, then it's cutting you off from social supports and things that are important, and people and things that are important to you. Um, if it's something where you're gonna get a ton of judgment and people just telling you to like eat more you know, turmeric and stop eating sugar and you know, have you considered whatever like this other thing is, um, and it's not, welcomed, like sometimes it's welcomed, it's great, but and it's not welcome to you, then it's probably going to drive more distance. So I think it's about thinking about what your ultimate value is and does it move you closer or further away. And you don't have to tell every person everything. You can tell a few people and not others and you know, just kind of let it be more fluid in that way. Uh, that's okay. Yeah. Okay, we've got a question over here. Next. And we still have some time. We still have about 15 minutes. 15 Hi. Ago. Where are you? Hi, I'm, I'm right here. Oh, thank you. Oh, I'm here. Gotcha. Hi. Thank you. You've given me a lot to think about here. My question is what about those well meaning people who go, you're so brave, you're so strong? Oh. It's, <laughs> you know, the head and tilt. It, how are you? How are you? So, and, you know, you don't want to be a bitch to them, you know, excuse me, but mm -hmm. it's just like, you know, it's just like, how do you deal with them? I think that it sort of uh, depends on your relationship with that person, you know, like if they're just like the cashier somewhere that you're visiting, you're never going to see him again, just move on, move on. Uh, if it's someone that's well-meaning but they're in, and they're in your support system and they're not giving you the adequate support that you need because they're saying unhelpful things, then it's worth giving them gentle feedback. There are effective communication strategies for expressing your needs. And it starts with, I really appreciate the support that you're offering me. I feel the care that you are directing towards me. Actually, my experience is blah, 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 blah. And it would be so helpful if I could hear from you, insert need here, you know. Be very specific. Be very specific. <clears throat> and don't expect to change people's whole personalities. Choose one or two behaviors that you can ask them to then yeah. adjust for you. Because they probably are well-meaning, and they just don't know what to say. <laughs> and Sometimes it's okay to give them permission to say, I don't actually need you to say anything. I just need you to hold my hand right now. Yeah. yeah. Bring me crossword puzzles sometimes. That would be great. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Hi. What ideas can you offer for those who you know are struggling but can't reach out? Mm. You know, there's a really old psychology joke. Um, 
how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? Uh, one, but the light bulb has to be ready for change. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think that one is that, you know, having a real talk with yourself about, um, like, courage. I, I think that what I'm, what everything that I have offered is basically the opposite of what is ingrained in us from society, from ourselves, right? It's all paradoxical. It doesn't make logical sense. And so it does once you like kind of explain it, but it takes a lot of courage to, to try something different and to reach out. And I say this to say, start easy. And for some people, easy is their best friend, right? Someone they super trust. For someone else, easy is a support group full of strangers who are not gonna run into you on the street. So choose easy. Start with something easy. What's an easy disclosure? What's an easy person to talk to that's kind of low risk? Probably it'll turn out a little bit better than what the anxiety is telling you because we know that whenever we measure anxiety, even in, even in trauma, um, anticipatory anxiety is always higher than even if the bad thing happens. Our brain hates uncertainty so much that it would actually rather just have the bad thing happen so we can deal with it than the uncertainty of it. You may have experienced this for yourself, but um, just test it out. See, does it, what's so bad about it? Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> this one was actually for a friend. How do you like ask your friend to open up? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, back to that light bulb uh, joke. Uh, it is, I think sometimes um, it can help people if you can start the conversation. So relationships are built on mutual levels of um, of emotional vulnerability. So like if I share something vulnerable. Other, the other person in the dyad is likely to match my vulnerability. And so it may help for you to start by sharing your thing and saying something like, I feel really nervous to bring this up, but I feel like I need to share it. And then that might give them the courage to do something vulnerable too. We don't know. I mean, it, it's not a perfect, you know, this is not user guaranteed, you know, satisfaction guaranteed, but um, it is a way to like kind of model for, for people that it's okay. Or even just guess at what's happening and just sort of bring it up yeah. without assigning it to a specific target or person. So we still have about yes. 10 more. Hello. Okay. Is there another question? I'm just I heard one. I heard I'm here. Somebody's... I'm right here. Ah, okay. There you, you go. Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Somebody talking over there? Who's first? I'm Who's here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I chose in my, uh, when I got my diagnosis over two years ago, I, I chose. Thank you. Less than easy. <laughs> I shut down. Mm -hmm. I was like, felt like I was in a, my closet. I didn't talk to my friends, only my closest family, which was my kids, they knew. Mm -hmm. And it took me a long time before I could tell a few friends. And the friends that really know me, I yappity yap. <laughs> so they knew something was wrong. They kept calling and calling, but mm -hmm. I would never say. And with courage, I talked about it. I didn't know how to deal with it, but I spoke about it. And I'm in my second year now, and I'm able to like even tell people at meetings and how I feel. I remember on the BCAN, because I'm in their support group, they had a topic like that one night and how do we deal with it, and that was so good to hear all everyone, their way of dealing with it. And that's how I'm dealing with it now. I stick with the beacon, and thank you very much. And it really is courage. It really is courage. It takes courage to mm -hmm. sign up to come to a meeting like this. 
and we appreciate everyone that is here because it, you know, it is a big step. You know, we offer this as an opportunity to be in a safe space with a lot of people who mm -hmm. actually know what you're going through, but it takes courage to sign up to be in that place where you're willing to step outside your safety net and put yourself in a position to talk to somebody else. And remember that fear is a necessary component of courage, right? Like I could slip on the soap and hit my head and get severely injured in the shower and yet no one has called me courageous for showering this morning. I don't know why, but I think I deserve it. But, right, so no one calls me that, but if I, courage, courageous for doing that, and yet if I did something else that was um, scary to me and I did it anyway, I would be called courageous. And so that's what courage is, is feeling the fear and doing it anyway. Definitely takes a little bit of nerve to come out here and be part of this group. So, okay. Hi, um, I, I'm a, I'm a bit of a newbie. I got my diagnosis last December, and my first reaction, like others here, surprisingly, was uh, denial. And uh, you know, I didn't want to tell my children. My daughter was eight months pregnant. I didn't want to tell my work colleagues because they depended on me and there was an interactive aspect to my work that I knew would have uh, been harmed by people. And more, I didn't, want, I didn't want to tell my friends, I didn't want to tell anybody because I didn't want that stigma, I didn't want to have to explain, I didn't want that sympathetic advice or any of it. And I really didn't know what to do at first other than going through the medical part of it. And it was thankfully because of BCAN, groups like Brian's, groups like the Neobladder group that I eventually uh, became part of. There's an organization called Cancer Care that offers therapy, both group therapy and individual therapy. And I had my treatment at Sloan Kettering. And um, as somebody said, there's all kinds of programs. So what I'm getting to is that um, I found support within the community and listening to other people and hearing their stories and that gave me the knowledge and the strength to be able to go forward in my life, not just with the medical part but with all aspects of it. And today all of those resources are incredible tools in the post-surgery -surgery recovery world of my life, and uh, I, you know, I can't, uh, I can't say strongly enough that uh, emphasize strongly enough that uh, that people should really reach out to to others. I guess people, if they're already in this room, they already know that. But uh, but uh, it was certainly a godsend to me, and I'm grateful. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to say that sometimes, I'm going to cry, I don't know why. <laughs> sometimes I feel like bladder cancer is kind of like a hidden cancer. Mm -hmm. It's like people look at you and they think you're fine. I'm three years out. In the very beginning, I'm a volunteer. So I volunteer bookkeeping and accounting. I'm carrying my bag with me, you know, from my bedroom to my office, still writing paychecks, still paying the taxes. I did all of that then. It's three years now and I'm done. I mean, I don't have the desire to do it anymore. I don't have the energy to do it anymore. I mean, I think, like, maybe we're not always completely well. I don't know how to look at it. But it's like nobody looks at me and thinks I'm sick anymore. You know, in the beginning, it was like, fine. Oh, you're amazing. Look at what you're getting done. Mm -hmm. And now when I say, you know, I am done. I'm done with it. No one will take me seriously. Like, what's wrong with you? You're fine. It's three years. Where's your problem? Yeah. So I don't know how to deal with that. It's like they don't see me. They're it's not a, seeing me anymore. That's a really common experience um, when people, in the beginning, there's a big rallying kind of force around you. Um, and then uh, after a while, because you don't look like TV cancer, um, then people forget or it's they forget to check in still or that you might still have issues or... Um, say, you know, you uh, have no evidence of disease currently, but 
So people are like, you should just be happy, just be fine, you're fine, you lived, right? But what they don't realize is that from a lot of people, they were just sort of in survival mode for a while, and now they're like, holy crap, I almost died, and I did not deal with that at all. And now I have neuropathy or other changes in my body. And so, um, and it, that's unfortunately a, a common occurrence where the support group system sort of recedes back into the bushes and, um, you know, people are left sort of hanging. I think that's where the support groups happen. I think that's where effective communication happens for the relationships that you want to salvage, creating relationships of people that will understand you. Um, and I think people don't know. They just don't know. And it is exhausting to um, have to express and teach others how to support you. And people take your lead. Okay, we have time for one last question over here. Uh, one thing that helped me to be open about my cancer was my father died of cancer at 53. And when he found out he had the cancer, he sat us all down and said, I have cancer. I do not want whispers. I do not want people walking out of the room or feeling bad. I want you to know you can talk to me and be open about it. And that helped so much throughout my time with him. And then flash forward, I get cancer. And you know, you told you're going to lose your bladder. That's a big thing. Mm -hmm. It's not a little thing. And I had a friend who had a friend who had gone through it, and they connected us. And it was so helpful to talk to somebody. So here's a side of being open that you might want to consider. I will let it be known almost wherever I am that I have bladder cancer and I wear a bag. I do that not to draw attention to myself, but then I tell the people, you know what? You may not know, or you may not have this. So you may never go through it, I hope. But chances are you're going to know someone who's going to get bladder cancer. I want you to know that they can talk to me. And I will be glad to share my story with them and encourage them. I'm a, member, I'm a survivor to cyber, survivor advocate. And that helps me because I'm sharing and helping somebody else. And the people that you do that for, whether it's bladder cancer or something else, will find out something. I'm not going to be a leper. I'm not going to be an outcast. My life's not going to be over. I can live with this and still have a quality life for what it's worth. So, <clears throat> Pam, what parting words do you have? Is there one more question? Yeah. We have time for one more question. Just real right. quick. Um, so I kind of am on the, f the flip side of Sherry here, but I, uh, of, you know, you go on and I think it like, I think you already answered my question actually now that I'm thinking about it because <laughs> you go through that really, really hard time and then you think I'm alive and I made it. And then the things that are the, I tend to think of them as annoyances. Um, you know, my insurance company's hanging up my catheters. I, you're all gonna be sick of this, but I have a hernia issue that's now gonna go on to the end of my natural life. Um, another issue, and I feel like, well, I shouldn't get upset about these things because I'm alive. Mm. And other people, like my husband, think, well, but honey, you're alive. And so that is like this whole other piece of this. So I really appreciate your comments on that. But I, I, I also want to say that, you know, that if, if you haven't done survivor to survivor, which you can do at any stage, right, in your, if you get a new diagnosis or say you were BCG and now you got to go to removal, you can go to survivor to survivor and talk to a survivor, you know, Karen Godfrey changed my life. And I will, she constantly says to me, Sandy, stop thanking me. So these programs, the female-focused support group um, that you mentioned, the, these are life-changing. And if you can't find a support group near you, um, like Brian said, start one. I'm sitting at a whole table of people who have changed my life because 18 months ago we decided, to your point, that Facebook wasn't good enough. <laughs> and 
We were going <clears> to <throat> move from the Indiana Pouch Facebook group, and we were going to start talking to each other once a month on Zoom. And these people right here have changed my life. And so if you're not in a support group, find one. And if you can't find one, start one. <laughs> Thanks, Sandy. Yeah. So I, I'll let you have the last word. Pat. I think for my parting words, I think it's actually echoing what I'm hearing from all of you, which is connect with what with your power. Connect with your superpower, what makes you tick, and then use it, exploit it, share it, you know, generalize it across situations. You're a good planner, here's a cope ahead plan. You're really good at planning, do it. You're um, someone who's really good, like you're a joiner, you know, join a support group. Follow what you, what makes you feel good, but also, while also being open to trying new things. Um, and then I'm gonna say it again, I'm gonna say it for a fourth time now. Active, pa active coping skills are better than passive coping skills. Please just use active coping skills. It'll go a long way, I promise. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, so many things that help people thrive in survivorship. Uh, I am going to give you 15 minutes. Now 